Okay, well, let's, uh, let's get underway, I guess. Uh, welcome everyone back for this afternoon. I'm sure we're going to have some additional folks joining us as soon as they get out of the food lines. Um, this afternoon's featured talk is from Greg K.H., who, as you know, stands head and shoulders above his peers, both figuratively and literally. And this, of course, highlights one of the major problems we're having in open source right now. We can't seem to field a, a good basketball team. So you need to recruit some of your tall neighbors to come and work with us, okay? <laughs> but in the interim, here, here is Greg, and I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Okay, this is easy. So please, heckle, ask questions. Let's just make this fun. Otherwise, I'll just burn through these slides and um, make everybody feel bad that they missed it afterwards. Um, okay, so um, first off, I want to say, Daniel, where? yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much for this, uh, and you'll see why later. Thank you. Um, and Akanu, Akanu, however you pronounce that, um, thank them. They sponsored Daniel to do this work a long time ago. Um, actually, how long? When was this written? When did you do that work? Okay, one year ago. But it was run on a kernel that was four years old. <laughs> so, or more. Okay. So. Here's this talk. So um, a lot of people are like, why are you working on Zen to me? <laughs> and um, I'm like, good question. Um, the problem is um, that I ran into a lot of people. Um, the cloud provider you guys have, um, if you're a DOMU user on EC2 or whatever else, it's really, really hard to change your kernel. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll show you how it is hard for you. In fact, Okay, I will. I'll, I'll show you what I want to do, and you can tell me how to do it right. Um, because that's how I got involved. I was like um, showing people how to make a really easy way to update their kernel quickly, and then all of a sudden it was like, oops, this didn't work on Amazon. Um, so the, I want to be able to boot the latest kernel that I came out with yesterday, or that came out with oh, stable kernel releases. And I really want to be able to boot, if that kernel fails, I want to fall back to a, a safe kernel. And I want to do it in a cloud provider independent way. Yeah. <laughs> and I also want to do it a hardware, and I want to do it in a, um, a hypervisor vendor, a hypervisor neutral way. And the way people do it today, like you will say, you can edit pvgrub, you can have configure files, and you can make custom images. EC2 will let you make a custom image. Then you got to make a custom image for Rackspace. You got to make custom image for Linode. Custom image for Dream, anybody. You gotta make t custom images to do it for your OS. It's hard, or you gotta mess with a package manager. You can package manager, you can have hooks into the package manager to go and select these properly if you update using RPM or using Debian. But there's a lot of people these days that aren't even using package managers. So how does that work? You update the kernel. So, best thing to do, that I always point at people at, and I was like, hey, just use kexec. Kexec is great, and I'll talk about what it does, I think, in a minute. Yes, kexec come on. Um, lets you run Linux from Linux, if you don't know what it is. So kexec basically says, um, user space says, here's a chunk, a binary blob, run it and get out of the way. And that's really cool. So it lets Linux boot Linux. You can boot another kernel. It lets Linux become a bootloader. On a lot of hardware platforms, kexec is used as a bootloader. Uh, PS3, kexec um, was the bootloader. Linux was the bootloader. Uh, cro um, core boot thought they started off messing with this and they ended up making it smaller, but it isn't that way. So we got it working on Zen. No, I got to work on KVM and a few other things until things died. But um, a, a lot of all the enterprise distros use kexec for another reason. When the kernel panics, kexec can be told, go run this binary blob, which is another Linux kernel which then dumps all of memory. So kexec is cool as it doesn't free memory, it doesn't clean it up, it just instantly transfers ownership over and boots and goes. So um, kdump works really, really nicely. Um, when the machine boots up for the first time, you pass a binary blob to kexec that says, here is your, if any panic happens, run this code. And that code just scans a whole big memory, dumps it to a disk file, and then reboots itself again to another known good kernel image. All the distros use it. They can send off core dumps to people. Um, it's very, very powerful, and that's the reason a lot of people use it. This is the reason why you wanted to do this for EC2. We wanted to get kdump working. Um, you can't do kdump today. 
on EC2. I would like to use KDOM. <laughs> a lot of people want to use KDOM. So the really cool thing is this. This is why I'm doing this. I told people, hey, sure, use KEXEC. It'll work great. And then they said, no, it doesn't work on Zen. I'm like, oh, crap. Wait, wait, wait. Jeez. All right. Here we go. Um, I, got, I will cover your pedantic things. Um, DOM 0 KEXEC will work today. Um, here's the way KEXEC will work today. Um, you can go KEXEC DOM 0 to DOM 0. You can go DOM 0 to Linux, so you can blow away all of, all of Zen. Or you can go Linux to DOM 0. You cannot do DOM U to DOM U, which is what all the cloud providers, because you don't have access to DOM 0. Unless they're running HVM, but then that's, K, that's KVM, right? Well, no. <laughs> What's the, well, no, how, how does that work? So um, HBM, you're not DOM U. You are DOM U. But I could not get it to work. It just fails. Linux, Linux, right? Linux to Linux and DOM U will not work. It should. Which version of Zen will that work? Three or four? Shouldn't? It should be. It should be. OK. <laughs> Oh. The HVM itself should work. The HVM itself should work. But, okay. I'll have to play with that. Maybe that's the solution. And I won't have to get all this code upstream. <laughs> so anyway, DOM U to DOM U would be nice, right? I mean, it would be a good goal. You could run, you could get Red Hat to, um, on a tiny instance or something on EC2 to actually get a crash dump out of it. Things like that. That would be cool. And thankfully, you did all the work. <laughs> um, and also, I want Linux to be the bootloader. Um, Linux is a really nice bootloader. Um, to do, you can do some really cool and powerful things. Within the Linux um, kernel, you can pack on a whole CPIO image of your NITRAMFS. And then you can do fun things like sign that in a cryptographically secure way. So you know the NITRAMFS and the code that you're starting up is, is signed. So UEFI can verify this. Your bootloader, your hardware above that can verify this. You can do fun things in that. And then you can only transfer ownership to another signed image beyond that. And I'll show you some examples of how you can do that. Um, a lot of people want to know that they're really running the code they think they're running. And if you sign entire partitions, if you sign entire disk images, you can ensure that if your bootloader was signed in the first place. So using pvgrub, you can't, which is a lot of people in the cloud care about this these days. And that's a valid thing to care about. You want to know what you're running. So here's how I talk about this. Um, uh, Chrome OS does this today on Chromebooks. It's a really, really powerful method. Um, they do the booting of the kernel in hardware. They have their own OS, they have their own BIOS, and they can do that. But this is what I want to do in the cloud. You want to boot a kernel that's signed, it's self-contained, it has its little NetRamFS, and then when it boots up, it looks, I have two system images, tiny system images, base core operating system only, and they're signed, they're secure, and then I know, I pick one to boot, because they both start off the same. I boot it, everything's happy, and then all my stateful data can be overlaid on top of that, and that's, that's access my other bigger disks and whatnot. But then when I want to update my distro, you want to update things, you write to, not your image, you write to the other image. And you write it all in one big block. You write it as, you can do diffs here, you can do binary diffs, the Chrome um, OS guys have a really, really good incremental diff for binary files that can push out tiny bits of data, and you implement everything. It's not for like a package manager where you implement some increment, some, or some files, and not other files. So you want to have a whole system image updated at once. Because I guess, especially with red, uh, RPMs, you don't want to stop halfway. You get, you get upset or something happens with the network, and then you reboot and your state of your system is in an unknown state. So you update your other system, you flip a bit in the partition table, and you reboot. Your boot kernel never changes. This is an old, stable, tiny kernel. It says, oh, I need to read this one and boot this one. If this one fails, it reboots again, or you reboot the system, it knows that it failed because the partition table wasn't marked, and it goes falls back to your other good one. So you have two states of good, known good images or a bad one, and then you just ping pong between the two. Chrome OS does this. The core OS guys do this today as well. It's a really nice way to update your system and keep things secure. Boot kernel, that, stateful data down there. And this overlays on top using AUFS, and then you can put Docker on here with containers, and you have all sorts of fun things. Um, that's why I'm doing this work.
was too fast. Yes? <laughs> Didn't know our room was so big. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, being recorded. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Oh, that, that'd be fine. Uh, did you try um, uh, fallback and save default in PV Grub? Did we try fallback and save back? No, we did not, because I want to be able to do this for any type of cloud provider. I don't want to have to write a new any image. Any SIM-based cloud provider should you be providing PV Grub? Yes, any SIM-based one should provide PV Grub, but then I can't check the um, signature to be sure it's secure. And I, there's a lot of people out there that want to know that this really is what it says it is. And that's a, a very good thing to do. Um, a lot of people are more cared about security these days. And they want to know that, especially running in a cloud environment. Yeah, PV Grub has support for measuring uh, it using a VTPM now. Just a what? Cool. A VTPM. Yeah. In PV Grub. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, so then who controls the TPM there? Well, you're in the cloud. I, mean. I know. So that's why. Yeah, that's the problem. So I want to, then you have to trust the TPM there. If I just know that this signature matches the signature I was okay with, then you're good. Because we have the DM, uh, one of the DM modules that will control your partition to make sure that it's, and it actually starts reading from it and executing from it while it's checking it out. So speed-wise, it's much faster. And then if it finds out that it's bad, it just instantly reboots. Um, again, the Chrome OS guys did this. Um, so yeah, but I don't want to mess with PV Grub. I want Linux to be here <laughs> and Linux there. Because if I do this type of thing, I can run anywhere. I can run on native hardware. And then what people can do is, and what people want to do, is they want to become cloud provider agnostic. They want to take their images and they want to be able to put them anywhere. You not just be able to move from different zones of Amazon, which is great, but be able to move to Rackspace, be able to move to um, OpenStack, being able to move their own thing, or being able to take their existing images and migrate it to real hardware. And I'm seeing that happen a lot. A lot of people want to move to their own hardware because when they get so big, they're tired of writing million dollar checks to Amazon, and then they want to move their own stuff or hire their own people. Um, so I want to heal, give people flexibility. So I want K exec to work in Zen. Dom you. That's why I did this work. Um, and spoiler, it doesn't work <laughs> yet. I got distracted. Um, the K-exec people were like, hey, we want signed K-exec to work, and then the interface is nasty, and why don't you do this? And I got messed up with that. And then the libraries, it was written for, I think, Zen 2, and a 2.6.16 heavily modified kernel patches. Yeah. And um, the Zen library is very weird. Um, so I'm messing with that. So I want to have the code up and running. It's barely working. Um, I want to have it working properly by the Developer Summit, which is in Edinburgh, right? So I'd like to show something working by then. So that's it. That was fast. Does that make sense? Why we want to do this? And why I want to do it in a neutral way? I mean, do you have any objections to having DOMU work KEXEC? Because then Crash Temp works. And Crash Temp is really good. And I want to, hey, yeah, so all the distros that care about that, and a lot of people care about that. So that would be cool. Well, how do you get the crash dump image out? Oh, the second kernel boots. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you just the you but where does it write the dump image the to? Where, do, where does crash you dump write the image to? Wherever, you, wherever it's configured to. OK, so, so we can write it to the block device. You can write it to a block device. You can write it over the network. You OK. Can, you can stream it over SSH. You know, it's, oh, it's completely okay. scriptable. Oh, cool. Okay. But this, this idea of using a kernel self-contained with this file system image is a really powerful thing. Um, right now, the kernel is kind of hard to build that way. We have some, you have to build the kernel twice, which is kind of a pain. Or you build all the drivers into the kernel, um, which is. So are, you, are you okay with still using pvgrub to get to the first boot kernel? Yes, that's fine. I know I have to do that. So do How else get, can I do that? I mean, can. yeah. Uh, so when it comes to measuring that first boot kernel, like you're, you're kind of still trusting the pvgrub. I still have to trust yeah. the pvgrub, yes. Right. Yeah, that's fine. And, and the fun thing is, um, also, when I'm doing these reboots from here to here to here, I don't have to go all the way back out to EC2 or, the, or to Zen and reboot the whole thing again. So I can do much, much faster boots. I can do this whole thing um, running on KVM in um, three seconds, two kernel boots, whole file system up and running. On my laptop running in QEMU, I think it's five seconds. Um, so and on, I got a really big hardware to test this on, and it's, it was like two seconds for two full kernel boots, load the file system, verify, check some everything, and go again. Um, 
fast, fast boots. The bias on those servers takes half hour. Um, you don't want to mess with that. You'd never want to reboot. And then, um, yeah, you don't want to have to worry about the latency involved in your cloud provider doing the reboot as well. So. How's that? Any other questions? That was too fast. I'm sorry. Oh, I was allocated 20 minutes. I did 18. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you two minutes to sing a song. No, I don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have anything else. Um, oh, yeah, it works. Oh, I have more slides. And Daniel, yes, thank you. I didn't want to start from the beginning. And obligatory penguin picture. Um, I talked to Karen. She is, or Kate, is one of the kernel developers. Uh, she gave me this penguin picture years ago, and she said she'd give me new ones now. Um, she took these down, and that's in Chile, but it was on her way to Antarctica. So those are actually a Linux kernel developer's penguins pictures. <laughs> Not mine. Um, cool. Any questions? Anything? So each, I want to try that on a big instance. To see how well it'll work. I'll mess with that later today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a good hand for Greg, okay? All right, thank you.